Hey guys, this is marketing advisor Rosalind Alba Cabarubias, and you are listening to the Influencers on Tractivist. Mabuhay! This is The Influencers, a new tract of a series on Asian American leaders, tastemakers, and experts in the music industry. Just as important as front-facing representation in entertainment is representation behind the scenes. Too often, these influencers in the music industry just don't get the deserved recognition for their incredible work that significantly impacts today's culture and entertainment. Let's dive into this podcast series as we spotlight these individuals and hear their stories and words of wisdom for aspiring artists and industry professionals. Hi, my name is Rianne Moore. It's my pleasure to welcome today's guest, Rosalind Kobarubias. Rosalind has helped produce over 500 concerts as well as editorial content with artists like Drake, Rihanna, and Kendrick Lamar. She currently serves as the Chief Marketing Officer and Head of Artist Relations of Iconic Reach an influencer marketing platform connecting brands to influencers and curators to create sponsored viral content. She is also the co-founder of MyDivio, a global talent discovery and video resume platform. Let's get started. Thanks so much for coming on. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm excited. Yeah, so on your website, um, mm-hmm. rosalincy.com, you're self-described as a marketing advisor, mm-hmm. TV host and producer, and entrepreneur. Yeah. And I'm sure this is just a few of multiple roles mm-hmm. that you have. So in your words, what would you say is your role in the music industry? Mm-hmm. And how do you fit into the music making process? You know, a long time ago, I, I was really uh, attached to titles. Once I gotten in the music industry, and that's really how it is, people, you, you know, coming around LA, they're like, what do you do? What do you do? What do you do? Mm-hmm. I like I like people not knowing what I did. I like being the silent person in the room. I'm like, I'm a traveling janitor. And then they figure it out later because uh, of how I could help connect the dots. And I would connect, uh, get to the next level by helping connect the dots, whether it's through people or it's marketing strategy or it's influencers sharing their content or their, their services or their products. I just help connect the dots. and. I, that's the best way I can say it. It's like it's not really just a title because there's so many things that I do, um, but that's just the basics of it. It's like if you break it down, it's really just connecting the dots, whether it's for brands, it's for people, it's for musicians, it's for artists as well. And it, it, that all stems into marketing, obviously. Yeah. yeah. Can you tell me about the path that you took to reach to where you are today? And when did you realize you wanted to sort of be part of this like marketing industry? I think um, early on, uh, well, first the music industry. So in elementary school, I knew what I wanted to do. I was a DJ mm-hmm. at elementary. So in sixth grade, I would play music that I would record from the radio um, and play it at lunchtime. So I would record, minus the commercials, just the top 10 countdown. And I would love when somebody would come up to me and say, I love that song, or what's the name of that song? I love that song too. And it gave me that feeling of like oh, enjoyment of like knowing that music can really connect people. It can make people feel emotions, whether good or whether bad. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to be a part of that marketing process of people discovering new music. So that was in elementary school. In high school, I also continued being the DJ at lunch, as well as the DJ at dances and stuff like that. But when it came to college and it came to deciding of what I was going to choose as a major, you know, we're Filipino, so our parents are like, you're gonna take care of us, so what are you gonna do? You're gonna be a doctor or are you gonna be a lawyer? Mm-hmm. So I chose to go the lawyer route because I could never, I never really liked math or science until I enrolled into UCI and I went to class every day and I was just memorizing books. And I hated it. I was like, this is college? I don't wanna go to college. I don't wanna be a lawyer. So then I went to an audition I, I saw on TV to be a VJ. And I waited in a line for about four hours. I made it to the top 10. And then in the last casting agent's office, she said, how tall are you? I said, 4'11", on a good day. (laughs) And she said, you'll never be on television. You should try radio. You're too short. What are you going to do, hold the microphone over your head when you do your interviews? And I remember feeling like, wow, like 
I can't believe I thought I thought I could actually have a you know a job that I was passionate about, which was music. You know, I've always wanted to do music, but maybe my mom was right. Maybe I had to do something more realistic. So long story short, I, I listened to what she said. She said, um, "You're too short. You should try radio. You should try radio." And rather than go back to UCI that summer, I actually found a radio station close to my house in Walnut at a awesome junior college called Mount San Antonio, Mount Sac. Mm. And um, I went to the radio station and I said, how do I get a radio show? And they said, you have to take radio broadcasting classes. I said, okay. So I enrolled into Radio Broadcasting 101 that summer. I went to class. They said, they taught us how to get a job in radio, how to market radio, etc. And I said, wow, this is school. This is awesome. And that's when I changed my majors. Um, I went to Mount Sac for a couple of years. I did the radio show there, just really uh, interviewing underground hip hop artists. So artists that I love, The Far Side, Most Def, Talib Kweli, A Tarp Called Quest. And then we moved that show to Cal State Fullerton, brought on real DJs, so like DJ SureShot, JP, Concise, and Analog. And then we started producing the show from Cal State Fullerton. And from there, long story short, sorry, it's such a long story. Uh, we, I got into marketing because a lot of the artists that I would meet, they would ask for marketing support. So they would support artists that I looked up to, but I found out every artist needs help and they need help in marketing. And so we started producing concerts, uh, little clubs where they could perform at, which was an extension of the radio show. You know, I would do it with DJ Vice at the, the dugout and stuff like that. And so that's when I realized what I wanted to do professionally could actually be a career. And we actually started making money. We made like a hundred bucks a week and we're like, yeah, we're killing it in the music industry. But that's, that's where I it went from, you know, having a passion for music and then DJing and then realizing what were my strengths were. And it really was the marketing side of it rather than be, um, you know, in front of, in front of the, the on stage and et cetera. I was never going to be the EDC headliner. I was never going to be so super Sam, but I'll be the marketing person that could produce these concerts and produce these events. And that's where it really stemmed from. Mm. Yeah. Out of curiosity, have you continued doing anything like DJing or music creation once you sort of started? Your- Definitely. Cause you, because what happens is as you get older, I'm 38 now, mm-hmm. you get into the corporate world, you do your jobs and then you find yourself like you still want to be passionate about. Now your passion has become your work. So you try to find other things that make you passionate about, um, passionate. So I do things like I DJed my high school reunion, my 20 year high school reunion, (laughs) um, and playing all nineties music. I DJed my niece's birthday party. She had a nineties party and she's only 16. So I'm like, wow, they they know about nineties music. What? This is crazy. My other niece, uh, she just turned one. She had a luau. So it was all reggae covers and reggae music. So I love that. I love playing for audiences where I know, you know, I might not be the best mixer, I might not be the best scratcher, but I know music selection. And so that's something that I'm really passionate about. I love playing. Um, and then some people will ask me just to do events. They ask me to do their weddings, but you know, you know, wedding DJ is like the hardest <laughs> job for anyone. Unless it's like we're going to Mexico or something like that, that I'll do it. But when we went to the Philippines, I was also the DJ when we rode along in buses and when we went to the beaches and stuff like that, we had an awesome group traveling through the Philippines. But I, I, again, I was a music selector there. Mm-hmm. So that keeps me passionate and keeps doing music. And at the same time, that's why I produce and uh, host TV shows uh, based on music and music festivals and stuff like that to keep my passion alive as well. Mm-hmm. I guess moving on to um, Asian Americans in the entertainment industry, mm-hmm. I feel like folks are these days are making headlines today mm-hmm. um, as new paths are being forged to make way for more diverse representation. Mm-hmm. And is this something that you've thought about in regard to your own identity and your career? Yeah, definitely. I think early on, I mean, I was a big fan of underground hip hop. And mm-hmm. so there wasn't too many artists. We had Apple, the Black Eyed Peas. We had um, Blue Scholars, you know, and of course the Beat Junkies and like the Invisible Scratch Pickles. But outside of that, there wasn't too many in the music industry. And so I think I always hid my identity. I hid my Filipino-ness, mm-hmm. try to, if you try to say that, until I went to the Philippines and I really saw the community, how they embraced um, our music. And I thought, wow, what can I do for my specific community? Not just for the hip hop community, not just for the music industry, but for my specific community. And so it really gave me back, um, made me apply that to my own identity and, and be proud of, of who we are. You know, I'm so glad there's people like Ruby Abara right now and like making a song like us and, and has a Island Girl Rise hashtag, you know, because that's, rep- that's representation now that didn't exist before. 
before. Um, and a, a lot of it was blended into different cultures because we're such a mixed breed of like, like Latino, black, Asian, etc. But now we're having our own identity. We're having our own voice, our own music festivals, our own events, our own food festivals. So now there's a sense of pride that I have and how can I bring out the community? So I'll volunteer to help produce the Filipino festival with Richie or um, I'll propose Filipino Heritage Night with the Clippers and just see how many, how many other things I could do to shine light on community members. And I, even in influencer marketing, we have a platform where we connect brands to influencers. And a lot of that time I'm like, what, what Filipinos do I know that could, we can plug into this program? Is it Farina? Is it, you know, all of, Jessica Lasaka? Like all of these awesome influencers that are out there that I want to work with, you know, um, and any time t- t- it comes to talent booking as well, I think first now Filipino artists, uh, because everybody else, they do it for their community, so why not ours? So when I worked with the White House, I thought of Lee and Dee first, and you know, just, just those opportunities to bring light to our culture and mainstream platforms, I think is really important and really excites me. Yeah, that is exciting. And from this unique perspective in um, the industry and the way that you've sort of shifted toward helping your own community, what do you think has worked in terms of making space for Asian Americans in music and yeah. where can we go from here? I think um, there was a shift when we actually started telling our own narratives and we weren't afraid to tell our own stories. So I think Apple the App um, of the Black Eyed Peas, he was the first person to actually, uh, you know, there's Bamboo, actually, there's, there's different artists, but specifically Apple because because he was such a pop mainstream artist and then he released the first song on a popular album that was winning Grammys and one of the songs was in Tagalog called The Apple Song. So I worked with Patricio to help put that music video together where we showcased the Filipinos. We put Chad Hugo, Dante Bosco, Joy Bisco and all of these people in it, Red Matic of the Beach Junkies. But it was a Tagalog song on a popular mainstream album. So that was the first time that there was a narrative about the Philippines, you know, in such a popular way. And so it paved the way for other artists now to be able to tell their stories from their own unique perspective, but knowing like but being generally themselves. Like Rubia Barra, she always tells her story. She grew up on hip hop, 90s hip hop kid, but when you but she still speaks Tagalog. You know, she still she still incorporates her community and her culture into all the music she makes. Bamboo is really great. Rocky Rivera, like a lot of these artists now, you know, thanks to the Mountain Brothers and thanks to all these people they, that have paved the way to let it be okay to just be who they are, tell their stories, and not have to pretend they're a part of something else and tell that story. You know, Ill Mind is another really great person that, that does that as well. Mm-hmm. And what challenges during this time have you faced during your journey of like to where you are right now? Mm-hmm. And what are ways people already in, in the industry can address this, if any? Um, I think Filipinos in general, um, especially Pinais, especially Filipino women, we're very, uh, we're just happy to be in the room. You know, we're very non-confrontational. We like to just um, sometimes not even take credit for our work. And there were times when I was an executive and, you know, I was the head of certain divisions and there, the, the, the table will be full. And like Cheryl Sandberg said at Facebook, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't sit at the table. I would be on the. I would be over here. Uh-huh. So here I am, the head of the, the the team, and I'm sitting on this chair because there's no room. But actually, I should be up here. And so now I'm really proud of that because I know that it's actually giving other people the confidence to then be to see somebody that looks like them in that position. You know, when we walk in a room, we look like we're interns. We look like we're supposed to. You know, mm-hmm. um, uh, but and I would I would shy away from doing things that was. So me, but now I embrace that. So I'm bringing Bandasal to the meeting. I'm bringing Lumpia, and then I'm sitting at the table. I'm bringing I'm bringing the interns in, like having it a part of the conversation. And it's okay to own the credit for your stories, the credit for your work, and stuff like that. And I want to empower Filipino women throughout the world, especially a lot of you in the Philippines, to do the same. Because I hear in the Philippines it's even harder. You know when they have. Um, people in the call centers and they ask people, you know, what, what's your advice or what do you guys think that we should do better? Nobody raises their hand because nobody wants to feel like they're going against what's currently happening. But having a voice doesn't necessarily mean that you're confrontational. It just means that you have knowledge and experience that needs to be shared. Mm-hmm. And so I think there's a beautiness in being a Panay, but um, 
but also, you know, they call it now an entrepreneur, where you're embracing both the leadership <laughs> and then the sensitivity and the, yeah. the caretaking that we're, we're natural caregivers. That's why a lot of us are in the hospitals. So it's, it's a, taking those two worlds and, and blending them too. Yeah, and lastly, a main goal of Tractivist is to provide support for all Asian American folks who aspire to use music as a platform mm -hmm. for both expression and storytelling. Mm -hmm. Uh, what is one takeaway that you would like people hoping to follow in your footsteps to know? Um, I think it's really important and it's hard in our community because we have a very crab mentality where one makes it and then it's like, oh, there's a lot of chisness around that person. Oh, they shouldn't have reached that success because blah, blah, blah. I wish there was more unification, um, not just in the Filipino community, but just in the Asian American music community. Because if you look at every single record label, every single video production company, every single Spotify, YouTube, Instagram, um, every manager, there's a Filipino in all of these companies and usually at a leadership position. So if we were actually able to unite and, you know, even on TVs, on TV show and castings, uh, they always complain that they want to hire Filipinos, but they don't know who to hire because we're not organized enough. There's no database that exists where here's all the Filipino actors, here's all the Filipino artists. So I'd love for us to come together more and network and really in a way that's uh, bridging together like social currency, we're offering value to each other to help uplift our community overall. So if the casting director is Filipino, they can hire a Filipino for this and this and this. Then our then our stories are being told, and it'll only amplify the awareness of of us throughout the world. And then we can continue helping share those stories. We're doing it in food. We've done it in dance. We've killed it in dance. We've won every world of dance, America's best dance for you can, and <laughs> really. But now it's time for the music industry. You know, let let why can't Ruby? perform at the BET Awards or the MTV Awards. She's a better lyricist than, than Cardi B or you know, right up there with Nicki Minaj. So let's empower her. And the way we can do that is by you know, the head of YouTube making her the featured video on YouTube. The, the person at Spotify putting her on a playlist with Drake and all of these top artists. We have the power to do it. It's just now we have to amplify the right artist, give the right artist a recognition and the talented ones and then it can it go further and we can create a million Bruno Marses because we have a million Bruno Marses. And are there any projects uh, coming up that our listeners or your viewers um, can look forward to? Yeah, well, uh, Cl uh, Clippers, we're coming back with Filipi Filipino Heritage Night on January 8th. Apple the App's performing again. Everybody gets a bobblehead of Apple wearing a, a Filipino necklace. Um, and Jessica Reynos is going to perform with him again. Jasmine Villegas is doing the national anthem. We're going to produce a, a basketball game after with DJ E-Man like we did. So that's definitely coming up. Um, Phil Dev is actually having a summit where they're gathering the top entrepreneurs, uh, tech people, marketing, all in Sunnyvale at Google. Regina is putting it together in Sunnyvale. They're also having a gala dinner for Phil Dev. And then uh, for me personally, I'm going to be launching a community and a clothing line called Little Bee Girl. So back in the day in college, I had a clothing line called Little Brown Girl. And it was literally the Bloomingdale's lo uh, logo little brown you know they have little brown bag we just mm -hmm. changed the word girl but we got a season to desist from bloomingdale's because oh. <laughs> the logo was exact and we were so young we didn't even know what that meant so we're like oh my god we're in trouble let's just stop but now i want to rebuild that community so a b-girl basically means a break dancing girl so back in the day i thought i was a b-girl i was like trying to dance everywhere you know dress like a boy and and now a b-girl is really just anybody that's pursuing their passion so it's building a community of of um, young women, specifically women of color, you know, specifically you know brown or it or actually you know any young girl, and knowing that you can be empowered to to pursue something that you're creative and you're passionate about. So I started out with an Instagram. And we feature an 11-year-old DJ, we feature a 10-year-old photographer, a five-year-old model, uh, because you see uh, in Instagram pages like The Shade Room or Baller Alert, a lot of these pages are have millions of followers and they're just promoting gossip. They're just promoting like who got shot or who slept with who, but why don't we have these communities where it's constantly you're being fed positivity, specifically about young girls, specifically about creativity. So now when somebody's wearing a little B-girl shirt or my mom's a DJ or something like that, then it'll bring that community together. So that's, that's what's up next. I think as I get older, it's not chasing 
titles anymore, like I said, or not being a part of corporate or creating companies. It's now having the freedom of time to actually figure out my purpose in life. And my purpose in life is to, you know, connect the dots, to inspire the younger generation, to create memorable experiences so that now they can have, see, acknowledge themselves as well as have value to help others. That's my purpose. So it doesn't matter what job I have, it is more what company I have. It's just figuring that part out of like, how, how can we connect this all? And that was our interview with Rosalind Covarubias. Thanks so much for listening to The Influencers. Be sure to visit our website, tractivist.com, as we create a central hub of Asian American artists, resources, and continuously update the influencers. Discover new music through our weekly radio show, as well as our playlists. We're also on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter as Attractivist. That's T-R-A-K-T-I-V-I-S-T.